when the war was over, um, Paramount, I was wor working in films in Paramount, got, they had a, an experimental television station called W6XYZ, which had been more or less closed down during wartime. But after the war, they got the first license for a commercial station west of the Mississippi. And they were, wanted to do a big program to open the television broadcasting for the very first time for the public. And they were going to have a big uh, program. Uh, uh, the station was changing its name to KTLA from W6XYZ. And why Frank Freeman, who was the president of television at the time, called me in and asked me if I would write the first television broadcast, which was to be a variety show with Bob Hope as the MC and all of the Paramount stars as part of the program. And I said, that's great. He says, will you do it? I said, yeah, but I need some inspiration. So he said, what kind of inspiration? <clears throat> I said, how much are you going to pay me? So he said, how should I know? He, I said, well, what do you think? He said, well, um, all I can tell you is this, that there is nobody's ever done a show. We don't know how much to pay a writer, but say about three years from now, all of the prices will be established and we will pay you the top price paid to a writer of a 90-minute television show at that time. I said, that's great. You're going to get the script in about three weeks, three, three years. I mean, <laughs> he wasn't too happy. I walked out and I went to the William Morris agency, which were my agents, and I said, go in and make a deal, the first deal for a television writer, and make sure it's a good one. So they walked in, and they argued and argued, and they finally came back. And the deal was Paramount was acquiring the agency for RCA television sets, and I was to be allowed to buy an RCA 10-inch television set at wholesale. And I did. That was the contract. That was the 90-minute show. <clears throat> and I used to run home. I got the set. I used to run home at lunchtime. Of course, at lunchtime, they put on a test pattern. And I would go home and sit and watch that. And um, then they wanted Bob for that first show, and I had written the show. And we did it uh, on a soundstage. It was next door to where uh, uh, Oblast's restaurant is now. It's now KMEX, I think. And it was the first time, and they put up bleachers, which nobody had ever done before. And they had these tremendous black and white uh, television cameras. And it... it, uh, it took two men to move them and another man to fix their hernias as they went by. And then they had monitors up around and uh, we had all of the Paramount people and Bob came out in front of, he had a duck around the cameras anyway, and he did his monologue and when it was over, he, he motioned me to come over. He says, what's wrong? These jokes aren't playing. These are pretty bad jokes. I said, Bob, same jokes you always do. He says, well, why aren't they laughing? I said, Bob, they're watching the monitors. They can see you on monitors, and they know that everybody in the audience outside can see you. And I said, and you've got a script in your hand. He said, what's wrong with that? He says, well, I said, well, they understand then that somebody wrote the jokes, and you're getting paid a lot of money for what other guys are paying, getting paid very little for, and they resent it. He says, well, they didn't resent it in the radio. He said, no, no, that was a secret between you and them because the audience outside couldn't see the script. Now they know exactly what you're doing. He said, well, what are we going to do? I said, well, you got to throw the scripts away and we'll wing it. It was the worst television show ever done up to that date or even since. Nobody could remember a line. Uh, it, the audience just sat there, shall we say. And uh, uh, Bob came to me later. He says, this medium will never catch on. He says, what comic is going to give up Sunday golf to learn a writer's script? And uh, so I said to Bob later, I said, because of you, they had to invent the idiot card. And they named it after you. So, as you know, for his entire career, uh, Barney McNulty was the chief man with the idiot cards. And the idiot cards, because Bob could not read a teleprompter, he was uh, farsighted. Uh, so they, had to, they were on six-foot sheets of cardboard, and Barney and uh, an assistant would run around with the lines of the script, and uh, they were two complete copies. So if he looked right, he saw one. If he looked left, he saw another. And that's how the shows were done. I understand Barney has kept them all in his garage. He's got piles and piles of those idiot cards that made Bob Hope's career. But the audience understood that the television audience was not seeing the idiot cards, so they forgave him, and they paid no attention to the fact that he was reading the material.